Jixiang and auspicious greetings to our Dharma brothers and Bodhisattvas online. It is a great pleasure for us to all be joined on this virtual three-day meditation instructors retreat so that we can experience, explore, and share together the possible methods and ways to assist in the dissemination of humanistic Buddhism in the West in the form of Chan Buddhism or Buddhist mindfulness. I would like to thank Venerable Ru Zhan from Chuan Deng Hui as well as Venerable Man Guang, our beloved and respected Chan Master at Fu Guangshan, for giving me the opportunity to take part in the lessons. Today, my topic is Chan Talk, Talk Chan. In the 90-minute session, I will be first of all going through the historical development of the word Gong An, and then its records of teaching and instructions used by the Chan masters from the past. And then in the second half of the session, I will be referring to some academic articles by Robert Scharf from UC Berkeley and other scholars on ways to think in the Gongan way, as well as ways to interpret these Chan Gongans to assist in our understanding and further utilization of these materials and stories in our future instruction opportunities. Then finally, I would like to refer to the real-life experiences of Venerable Master Xingyun, our beloved teacher, in the ways that he was very Chan and in his very skillful and opaic ways of using witty moments to help us become inspired and awakened. I hope these materials will be of valuable reference to you. As we speak of the word Chan, we almost always immediately think of the word Gong An. And Gong An is exactly what makes Chan Buddhism so special. Its use of nonverbal expressions in order to directly embody the original mind, where one then sees the nature of mind and thus attains Buddhahood, allows us to immediately see the purpose as well as the means by which Buddhahood or awakening is attained. The use of non-verbal expressions is what actually makes Chan Buddhism so spontaneous and creative in the dialogues that we hear between master and disciple, and the words that are enigmatic and sometimes perplexing, but at the same time fascinating through its cryptic yet skillful means of enlightening or inspiring a student to attain awakening. So what does Gong An mean? On a basic level, Gong An is a Chinese transliteration and Koan in Japanese. Roughly translated into English, it refers to a public test case in Chan investigation. This is usually given via an encounter dialogue between master and disciple where one asks a question in order to solve a problem. But in return, the master gives a very fascinating and sometimes, as said before, enigmatic answer that aims at breaking the disciple's attachment to either concept or ego in order to directly point to the mind. Sometimes other than a dialogue, it could simply be a Chan master's statement or a question as an answer for another question to inspire the student to investigate or chan further into the answer or reality. So Gong An is sometimes also simply known as a Chan or Zen riddle. This Chan riddle is usually used by a master to ensure that the student or the guest stays in touch with the original state of the mind. So this being said, in most cases, people would take Gong An 
to be illogical paradoxes or unsolvable riddles intended to frustrate or even short-circuit the intellect in order to quell their thought and bring the practitioner to enlightenment. We see a video on TED that gives a seven-minute brief introduction about Chan Gongans. How do we explain the unexplainable? This question has inspired numerous myths, religious practices, and scientific inquiries. But Zen Buddhists practicing throughout China from the 9th to 13th century asked a different question. Why do we need an explanation? For these monks, blindly seeking answers was a vice to overcome, and learning to accept the mysteries of existence was the true path to enlightenment. But fighting the urge to explain the unexplainable can be difficult. So, to help practice living with these mysteries, the meditating monks used a collection of roughly 1,700 bewildering and ambiguous philosophical thought experiments called koans. The name, originally Kung An in Chinese, translates to public record or case. But unlike real-world court cases, koans were intentionally incomprehensible. They were surprising, surreal, and frequently contradicted themselves. On the surface, they contained a proverb about the Zen Buddhist monastic code, such as living without physical or mental attachments, avoiding binary thinking, and realizing one's true Buddha nature. But by framing those lessons as illogical anecdotes, they became tests to help practicing monks learn to live with ambiguity and paradox. By puzzling through these confusing cases, meditating monks could both internalize and practice Buddhist teachings. Hopefully, they would let go of the search for one true answer and trigger a spiritual breakthrough. Since these are intentionally unexplainable, it would be misguided to try and decipher these stories ourselves. But like the monks before us, we can puzzle over them together and investigate just how resistant they are to simple explanations. Consider this koan illustrating the practice of no attachment. Two monks, Tanzen and Ekido, are traveling together down a muddy road. Ahead they see an attractive traveler, unable to cross the muddy path. Tanzen politely offers his help, carrying the traveler on his back across the street and placing her down without a word. Ekido was shocked. According to monastic law, monks were not supposed to go near women, let alone touch a beautiful stranger. After miles of walking, Aikido could no longer restrain himself. How could you carry that woman? Tanzen smiled. I left the traveler there. Are you still carrying her? Like all koans, this story has numerous interpretations. But one popular reading suggests that, despite never having physically carried the traveler, Aikido broke monastic law by mentally clinging to the woman. This type of conflict Examining the grey area between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law was common in koans. In addition to exploring ambiguity, koans often ridiculed characters claiming total understanding of the world around them. One such example finds three monks debating a temple flag rippling in the wind. The first monk refers to the flag as a moving banner, while the second monk insists that they are not seeing the flag move, but rather the wind blowing. They argue back and forth, until finally a third monk intervenes. It is not the flag moving, nor the wind blowing, but rather the movement of your minds. One interpretation of this koan plays on the supposed wisdom of the arguing monks. The first asserting the importance of the observable world, the second favoring deeper knowledge we can infer from that world. But each monk's commitment to his own answer blinds him to the other's insight, and in doing so, defies an essential Buddhist ideal, abolishing binary thinking. The third monk identifies their conflict as a perceptual one. Both arguing monks fail to see the larger picture. Of course, all these interpretations only hint at how to wrestle with these koans. Neither the wisdom from practicing monks before us, nor the supposedly wise characters in these stories can resolve them for you. That's because the purpose of these koans isn't reaching a simple solution. It's the very act of struggling with these paradoxical puzzles 
which challenge our desire for resolution and our understanding of understanding itself. Want to try your hand at some puzzles that do have resolutions? Check out our Riddles playlist and get solving. However, do Gong Ans really serve the purpose of confusing you or breaking your brain? We can find answers by going back to the etymology of the word Gong An to really understand what it means. While the early history of the term Gong An is obscure, by the Southern Song Dynasty, it was commonly used in Buddhist sources to refer to a short anecdote or verbal exchange called from the records of eminent patriarchs and subjected to written commentary, the judgment, in prose and verse. This use of Gong'an was intended, as it would seem, to liken these documents to the record of criminal cases that was set on a magistrate's desk, an an and used as legal precedents. For example, if we break this down, we will see Gong An, or public cases, are likened to case documents of the public court, Gong Fu Zhi An Du. They embody the law, and thus the control of this order through the kingly way truly depends on them. Gong, or public, on itself, pertains to the ultimate principle, Li by which the sages unified the wheel ruts and standardized the roads throughout the empire. Case, or An, are the authoritative writings recording the principles set forth by the sages. There has never been an empire without public courts, and there has never been a public court without case documents that are regarded as law and are used to eliminate impropriety throughout the empire. In other words, when public cases or gong an are utilized, the principles and laws are put into effect. When principles and laws are put into effect, the empire is rectified. When the empire is rectified, the kingly way prevails. This is recorded in the Sanfang Ye Hua for the purpose of understanding where the words gong an come from, the meaning they entail and the purpose that they're supposed to serve. So why did Chan masters use Gong Ans? How did it get started? Where did it come from? How did it become so popular? The origins of the Buddhist use of the term Gong An remain obscure. The earliest references are associated with a handful of Chan masters from the Tang dynasty. Typical is this anecdote from the biography of Chen Zhun Xin, a disciple of Huang Bo, that was preserved in the Jing De Chuan De Nu, or the Jing De Era record of the transmission of the lamp. In this Gong An, the master saw a monk coming and said, this is an obvious case, but I spare you 30 blows. The monk said, but this is the way I am. The master said, why do the Vajra guardians at the monastery gate raise their fists? The monk replied, this is just the way they are. The master then hit him. The phrase obvious case Xian Chen Gong An seems to mean your guilt is written all over your face. Coupled with the reference to a punishment of 30 blows, the metaphor is quite clear. That the master is figuratively positioned as a magistrate with the power to judge the defendant's case and to mete out appropriate punishment. We also have to see that Tang references to Gong An are quite rare. The phrase, this is an obvious case, or Xian Chen Gong An, but I spare you 30 blows, is repeated in the collected sayings of Yun Men, where it is again attributed to Chen Zhuan Xin. 
The term Gong'an appears twice again in Yunmen's text, referring in each instance to a legal or criminal case. For example, someone asked Yunmen, If a totally ignorant one comes, how do you help him? The master replied, Both cases, his and yours, are taken care of by a single indictment. In Chinese, Liang Chong Gong An, Yi Zhuang Ling Guo. Based on this, we see that the legal metaphor of settling the matter moves from how ordinary people bring unresolved matters to the public court to an official, and the official then selects a case record called An Du. Then, based on such a case, settles the matter. Going from this, the Chan master brings it to another level where, in cases of a Chan practitioner, when the student does not understand something and cannot settle it himself, he will go to his teacher and question his teacher about it. What happens is then the teacher selects the appropriate public case and then settles it. Based on this, it can be said that a Buddhist Gong An is a case where a highly symbolic and occult encounter dialogue or exchange unfolds, usually between a Chan student and a Chan master. In certain cases, it may not be a dialogue, it could just be a Chan master's statement or question for investigation. The interaction is usually quick and terse and is often more significant in non-verbal communication rather than verbal. This understanding of Gong An is allied with a view of Chan as an iconoclastic and anti-intellectual tradition that rejects sutra, doctrine, philosophy, and indeed all forms of conceptual understanding in favor of unmeditated or pure experience. In such cases, Gong An's are akin to the torch of wisdom that eliminates the darkness of the passion. It is also compared to a golden scraper or the Jin Gang Pi that cuts away the film clouding the eye, glaucoma. It can also be the sharp axe that severs the life root of birth and death. Furthermore, Gong An is akin to the divine mirror that reflects the original face of both the sage and the commoner. Such instrumental views of Gong An were of an earlier period. And in more recent views, scholars have begun to see that Chan is much more complex than that. For one thing, Chan literature and practice are more than mere means intended to engender a singular and ineffable spiritual experience. Though little progress has been made in deciphering the doctrinal and exegetical intent of Chan Gong An, we can't help but wonder if Gong An is even a form of exegesis. According to Robert Scharf, it's still possible to recover the original meaning and doctrinal purport of at least some of the cases. And thus, when Gong An is put in writing, scholars have begun to believe that these Gong An's were intended to embody and facilitate an approach to knowledge. In other words, to inspire Chan practitioners to begin thinking in cases. For example, in the Ling Ji Si Liao Jian, which means the four ways Master Ling Ji interacted with his disciples or visitors in a Chan encounter, he based his methods on the four following conditions. First of all, the Chan Master would see the opportunity to break the student's attachment to the ego rather than the object. Secondly, there will be cases when the Chan Master decides to break the student's attachment to the object rather than the ego. Thirdly, the Chan Master might break the student's attachment to both the ego and the object. And lastly, the Chan Master may also choose to break neither if the student or the visitor is not attached to either. 
So the subject-object relationship, as well as the student's attachment to one or the other, will determine the master's use of just one or a combination of the above, depending on their condition or outlook, as well as the life circumstances of the encounter. The Lin Ji Si Bing Zhu is also another way by which the master establishes the guest host or disciple master relationships. There will be cases when the guest is experienced enough to understand the host. And secondly, there will be cases when the host needs to penetrate the guests. This is the moment when the host is able to penetrate the mind of the visiting guest. And thirdly, there will be cases when the host and master will see each other. And so the two in a Chan encounter will understand each other and are of the same wavelength. Fourthly, a guest meeting with another guest will involve an encounter of two practitioners, both of whom do not have the eye to see the true nature of the mind. Each of the four relationships will pose a different situation by which the master or the guest speak to one another. Under such intricate systems of decision as well as utilization of gong'an, it can be seen that gong'ans are not devoid of content or meaning. The Chan practice or Chan literatures could be more than mere means intended to engender a singular and ineffable spiritual experience. In other words, the purpose of a gong'an can thus become manifold. For example, to ensure that the Buddha mind is open and revealed in either the guest or the student. Secondly, the purpose for the essentials of complete transcendence to be fulfilled in a Chan encounter. Thirdly, when the host and the guest understand each other well that they are of the same wavelength, final emancipation or the total penetration of reality can thus be achieved. Just one extra note. The notion that Chan is anti-intellectual and repudiates words and letters is belied by the fact that the Chan tradition produced the largest literary corpus of any Buddhist schools in East Asia. And this corpus consists in large part of recorded sayings, yu lu, and records of the transmission of the flame, chuan den lu texts which recount the careers and teachings of past patriarchs from which the original edicts were drawn. Some of the most popular Chan texts include the Blue Cliff Record, Bian Lu, as well as the Jing De Chuan Den Lu. Of course, there are many other texts, but I'm going to just choose some of this for us to begin looking at why Chan Gong'ans can be so mesmerizing and attractive. The Gong'an of Zhao Zhou's dog is where it all began. So a monk approaches Chan Master Zhao Zhou and asks the question, Does the dog have Buddha nature? Immediately, Zhao Zhou replied, No. This pithy exchange between an unidentified Buddhist monk and the Tang Dynasty Chan Master Zhao Zhou Chongshen is perhaps the best known example of a Chan Gong'an. Or public case. Although the passage occurs in a collection of Zhao Zhou's sayings supposedly compiled by his disciples, the fact that it's so notorious is due to a Song Dynasty master, Wu Men Hui Kai, who placed this exchange at the beginning of his famous Gong'an collection, Gateless Barrier of the Chan Tradition, Chan Zhong Wu Men Guan. I'm going to spend a little bit of time analyzing this particular gong and later in the session. But let's move on to another game changer in the history of gong an, which is that by Huinan recorded in the Platform Sutra, where a part of his most important quote where he says, not letting a thought arise in any object outside is sitting. And seeing the nature of self undisturbed inside is meditation, is the gong an that completely changed the whole idea of seated meditation or gong an chan. 
This became the turning point for Chan practitioners, who began to go into the trend of getting enlightened by investigating Gong An's and engaging in Chan encounters instead of just sitting. We understand that the formal ritual of seated meditation is known as the patriarchal Chan or Zhu Shi Chan. Zhu Shi Chan features a plain and simple style in that practitioners do a lot of formal seated meditation. And even if they do speak up, they do not use much, if any, highly enigmatic and perplexing language, whether verbal or nonverbal. Thirdly, Patriarchal Chan involved the transmission of the mind seal to one or more disciples from the master. The practice of merely sitting to meditate was totally changed from the moment Huinan uttered his very important quote. What Huinan meant to do was to break the preconception that enlightenment or awakening can only be attained through long hours or moments of seated meditation. Even moments when you're in action, when you come in full connection with the Buddha's teaching beyond concepts, awakening is thus attainable even if you're in action. This point is further demonstrated in the dialogue between Ma Zhu Dao Yi and Nan Yue Huai Rang, as mentioned by Venerable Zhi Yue earlier, when Ma Zhu Dao Yi sat down in seated meditation as an attempt to attain enlightenment. And upon seeing this, his master, Nan Yue Huai Rang, takes out a brick and starts to rub it on the ground. When Ma Zhu asked, What are you doing? Huai Rang answered, I am trying to rub it to turn this brick into a mirror. And then Ma Zhu says, How can you turn it into a mirror by rubbing and polishing it? Huai Rang answered, If rubbing and polishing a rock won't turn it into a mirror, how then can seated meditation lead you to enlightenment? Understanding what his master had meant, Ma Zhu Dao Yi later attained enlightenment through the simple acts of daily routine and labor rather than long hours of seated meditation. Now, it seems like the question and answer between master and student, as well as host and guest, somehow became a ritual in the practice of Gong An Chan. And to regard it this way is again to present an instrumental view of Chan. But we must realize that the Chan practitioners or Chan masters never deviated far from the practices of chanting the Buddha's name, laying prostrations, or chanting mantras. The ritualized question and answer process in Gong An Chan merely served as a reminder of the contingency of all forms including the teachings of the Buddha himself alongside the day-to-day -day rituals of Buddhist practice. This shows that every conceivable means of expression can be employed to test, confirm, or trigger awakening to the original nature of the human mind. Let us not forget, whatever the action is, whatever the process is, whatever the practice is, or even if it is a ritualized process, we must remember that the subject of every Gong An is always awakening. It never changes. Whatever a master says or does in this context, it's always about awakening. So, there may be many different types of verbal or nonverbal languages in Chan Buddhism. For example, expression through body language, through shouting and hitting, through nonsensical language, through fancy but enigmatic language, or even in the forms of wild fox chan or kuang chan, crazy chan. What the chan masters want to demonstrate through all means of expression are believed to facilitate the teaching and learning process for the ultimate purpose of awakening. Let us never forget that, and never just read words on its surface, because the moment you start to do that, you get further away from the ultimate teaching.
Having clarified the historical development, the definition, and the ultimate purposes of Chan Gongwans, let's in this section go into the Buddhist hermeneutics of Chan Gongwan. And what I'm going to do is I will be using the article How to Think with Chan Gongwan by Robert Scharf from UC Berkeley to display the basic unfolding and analysis of a Chan Gongwan with clear relevance to the Buddhist sutras as well as the concepts of Buddha nature. This is a very wonderfully written article in that it's packed with Buddhist exegesis information as well as the methodology to how we can understand a Chan Gongan. And I think this is important for us to learn to read not just on the surface nor between the lines, but really find different ways to cut into this diamond and discover the true gem which the Chan masters have embedded into every one of them. The article is about 85 pages, and so what I will do next is try to summarize it into a few PowerPoints for us to get a basic idea of what Robert Sharp wants to say. And if you're interested, you can also read it. The link is provided at the end of my PPT. I think if you love Chan literature, you will really enjoy this article, though it is a bit difficult. While the dog Gongan became notorious as the first case of the 13th century gateless barrier, the anecdote was culled from the writings of the 9th century Chan master Zhao Zhou. Before we are able to grasp the mind of such response, we must first realize that the dog Gong'an is all about a debate over whether insentient objects possess Buddha nature, which arose around the 7th or the 8th century. In Chinese, Wu Qing Fo Xing. In a nutshell, the doctrine of the Buddha nature of the insentient, Wu Qing Fo Xing, first emerged during the 7th and 8th centuries and held that not only do all sentient beings inherently possess the Buddha nature, but so do plants and trees, stones and tiles and even particles of dust. Stated in this manner, it might appear as simply another expression of the familiar Mahayana teaching of emptiness. Since the existence of something always depends on the existence of something else, there is nothing that possesses an abiding essence or intrinsic nature, zixing or svabhava. And thus everything is ultimately the same, inherently pure and quiescent. Nevertheless, the claim that insentient objects possess Buddha nature would have sounded odd, if not preposterous, to a medieval monastic. As early critiques were quick to point out, the doctrines contravened well-known passages in authoritative Mahayana sutras. Moreover, there were no recorded cases of an insentient object actually attaining enlightenment and becoming a Buddha. The origin of the controversy links to Dao Shen, who first advanced the position that all sentient beings, including Ichantika, possess Buddha nature. The technical Sanskrit term Ichantika refers to precisely those sentient beings who lack the potentials for Buddhahood, as stated explicitly in the sixth fascicle version of the Nirvana Sutra. According to this text, translated sometime between 410 and 418, while Buddha nature is eternal, Ichantika do not possess it. Daosun disagreed insisting that Ichantika also possessed the seeds of Buddha nature and will one day attain Buddhahood. Daosun's position was vindicated with the appearance of Dharma Shema's translation of the Nirvana Sutra in 421. This so-called northern recension is not consistent on the topic, but it does contain a few passages indicating that all sentient beings, including Ichantika, possess Buddha nature and will eventually attain enlightenment. This text is accordingly celebrated as the earliest and most important canonical statement of the universality of Buddha nature in China. However, the possession of Buddha nature is unambiguously restricted to the sanctioned. Non-Buddha nature refers to insentient things such as walls, fences, tiles, and stones. 
Everything apart from insentient things such as this is called Buddha nature. This understanding prevailed throughout the northern and southern dynasties. While Hui Yuan has all the pieces in place, he never actually states that insentient objects possess Buddha nature. Robert Scharf in the article goes on to give an analysis of different theories about Buddha nature. The developments that would lay the groundwork for the Buddha nature of the insentient position did not begin until over a century later. This is usually traced to the 6th century monastic Jingying Huiyuan, who was interested in the relationship between the Buddha nature doctrine set out in the Nirvana Sutra and the notion of originally pure mind. To cut the story short, Huiyuan makes a pivotal distinction between the Buddha nature that knows, Neng Zhi Xing, and the Buddha nature that is known, Shuo Zhi Xing. The former is described as the mind of true consciousness, Zhen Shi Xing, that is capable of awakening to Buddha nature through the elimination of ignorance. Huiyuan explains that this nature is situated in sentient beings and does not extend to the insentient. Thus, when the Nirvana Sutra restricts possession of Buddha nature to the sentient, it is referring to the Buddha nature that knows, Neng Zhi Xing. The latter, the nature that is known, Shuo Zhi Xing, is identified with the Dharma realm, emptiness, ultimate truth, and so on. Hu Yuan explicitly says that this aspect of Buddha nature is universal, penetrating everywhere, one implication being that it extends to insentient as well as to sentient beings. On another case, the Sanlun exegete Ji Zhang takes a somewhat different approach to the issue. Rather than dividing Buddha nature into two aspects, one of which is associated with the insentient and one of which is not, Ji Zhang argues that the distinction between sentient and insentient is itself empty. Thus, if you're going to deny Buddha nature to something, then you pretty much deny everything else. In other words, he says, well, both sentient and insentient beings are devoid of Buddha nature. In this case, the Buddha nature is referred to as a provisional name. But in the sense of non-duality, all distinctions disappear. So in this case, if you say one of either possesses Buddha nature, then the other must have it too. But at the same time, if sentient beings have delusions, that means they thus can attain awakening. But grass and trees have no mind, and those that have no mind will have no delusion. And if you have no delusion, what is the need for enlightenment? In the third case, Zhan Ran's view on this is found in his Jin Gang Bei, a short work written around 780 devoted exclusively to the defense and clarification of the Buddha nature of the insentient. His argument is simple. The Mahayana doctrine insists on the universality of Buddha nature, and it will not ultimately brook a distinction between sentient and insentient beings. Even if one understands, one wouldn't say so. In this case, he is playing the Upaya card. Now back to the context of the dog Gong An. In the context of Buddha nature, the full exchange from what we see simply on the slide that says a monk asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? Zhao Zhou replied, no, is extended in the Zhao Zhou Zhen Ji Chan Shi Yu Lu. Let's take a look. The extended version of the Gong An goes as followed. A student asked, does a dog also have Buddha nature or not? The master said, it does not. The student said, everything from the Buddhas above to the ants below has Buddha nature. Why does the dog not have it? The master said, because he has the nature of karmically conditioned consciousness. There is some evidence that the query concerning the Buddha nature of dogs was an often repeated challenge given to Chan masters. It is found in the biographies of other Tang masters as recorded in the Song compilations. 
At first glance, it might not be evident that the understated context of this exchange was the Buddha nature of the insentient controversy. But look at another dialogue found later in Zhao Zhou's record. A student asked, Does an oak tree also have Buddha nature or not? The master said, It has. The student said, Then when will it become a Buddha? The master said, when the sky falls to the earth. The student said, When will the sky fall to the earth? The master said, When the oak tree becomes a Buddha. In the third case, a student asked, Does a dog also have Buddha nature or not? The master said, The road in front of every house leads to Chang'an. Zhao Zhou's response to the second question about the oak tree suggests that he will accept, at least provisionally, the Buddha nature of insentient things such as trees. And in the third exchange, he has no trouble conceding Buddha nature to dogs as well. So why does he deny it to dogs the first time around? So let's go back to the three scenarios. In question one, Obviously, the first questioner is fully aware, of course, that according to Buddhist teachings, all sentient beings have Buddha nature. No educated monastics would mistake the interlocutor's question as an expression of ignorance. The question makes sense only in light of the Buddha nature of the insentient debates. It is a challenge to Zhao Zhou to articulate his understanding of the controversy in a manner that remains true to Chan principles. Zhao Zhou must respond in a fashion that does not express attachment or reify the distinction between sanctioned and insentient or between having and not having Buddha nature. At the same time, he must avoid positing a third medial position one that would affirm the non-duality of sentient and insentient, since to do so would merely spawn a new conceptual dichotomy. This time between, one, the absolute wherein all distinctions are resolved, and two, the contingent realm of plurality. Zhao Zhou's response, his unapologetic denial of Buddha nature to dogs, denotes his freedom from attachment to doctrine. In other words, his acknowledgement that no conventional formulation is ultimate, and at the same time his refusal to attempt to articulate a medial or transcendental position. In such a case, one is the absolute wherein all distinctions are resolved, and two, it is the contingent realm of plurality. Zhao Zhou's unapologetic denial of Buddha nature to dogs represents, first of all, his freedom from attachment to doctrine. Second, his acknowledgement that no conventional formulation is ultimate. And thirdly, his refusal to attempt to articulate a medial or transcendental position. In this writing, we see that Wu Men was familiar with the Buddha nature of the insentient context of these exchanges as is evident in his commentary to the case. In the immediate context of the dog Gong'an, woman's reference to the spirits of grasses and trees here we see on the slides is a subtle allusion to the Buddha nature of the insentient con controversy. Like Zhao Zhou, woman refuses to countenance either side in the debate, while at the same time rejecting a medial position. Woman does this through a literary reference that alludes to a sentient abiding in grasses and trees, while the immediate context implicitly denies sentience to dogs. In other words, Zhao Zhou's emphatic insistence that dogs do not have Buddha nature would, one would suppose, make it even less likely that grasses and trees, which are insentient, which means devoid of spirit or ling, possess Buddha nature. But in a twist characteristic of this genre, woman declares that if you do not grasp the import of Zhao Zhou's denial of Buddha nature to dogs, then you are akin to the spirit, the sentience, that dwells in grasses and trees. In conclusion, Chan Gong An presupposed a high degree of familiarity with Buddhist literature doctrine, and dialectic. 
For example, many gongans reiterate the teachings that emptiness is not attained through transcending the world of form. Instead, emptiness is the world of form properly apprehended. So Zhao Zhou's no is not the denial of Buddha nature to dogs. It is a rhetorical strategy for eluding the conceptual trap laid for him. He must neither deny nor affirm the doctrine of Buddha nature, and at the same time must avoid postulating a third transcendental position. One finally realizes that through this argument, freedom lies in the realization that there is no freedom. And transcendence lies in the understanding that there is no transcendence. In Chan Buddhism, any notion to reify a doctrine or principle, such as causation or Buddha nature, is all a trap. That is why we summarize and conclude the Buddhist hermeneutics of Chan Gong An with this equation. X if and only if not X. In this third section, I would like to talk about Venerable Master Xing Yun's Chan moment, or Chan Ji. Although Chan Ji is literally translated as the opportune moment where a fully attained master of Buddhism knows to give the best remark suited to the best moment, we have already, through Zhao Zhou's dog, Gong An, gone through the very complex philosophical unfoldings of a Chan argument. And it involves a very complex and systematic understanding of certain sutra doctrines. But as we come to Venerable Master Xing Yun's Chan or opportune moment, we can't help but discover this wonderful taste or touch of directness that once again reminds us that the basic or the ultimate purpose of Chan is not through any forms of ritual connect directly to our Buddha nature. And Venerable Master Xing Yun very skillfully articulates this spirit in humanistic Buddhism, which he advocates. According to him, the characteristics of humanistic Buddhism is a basic philosophy of life that encourages us to integrate the Buddha's teaching of kindness, compassion, joyful, and equanimity, which are the four Brahma Viharas, or the four immeasurables, into our daily lives for the benefit of ourselves as well as others. Furthermore, Venerable Master Xing reminds us that humanistic Buddhism teaches us the way to cultivate the wisdom that clearly understands the true nature of all things. This being said, his definition of humanistic Buddhism, which begins with Fo Shuo De, or what the Buddha taught, and directed at Ren Yao De, which is for human beings. And ultimately, this origin and this target should serve the following two purposes, which is that which purifies. In other words, when we speak what the Buddha taught to the human beings in a way that's suited to their aptitude, you have to make sure that the teaching purifies their three types of karmas. And ultimately, the outcome should be virtuous and beautiful. In other words, in humanistic Buddhism, our teachings are deeply rooted on the Buddha's words, while the target is clearly for human beings within this human world, in this human life. And the purpose is clear, purifying our own deeds so that we too possess the Buddha nature to create a better world. And finally, the perfect outcome of a world that is virtuous and beautiful. Venerable Master Xing Yun displays his witty and skillful opportune moments or Chan moments in everything he does, in the writings he has published, in his own actions, in his own words of teachings, and even in his latest days when he has lost 99% of his vision, he continues to spread such a wonderful spirit of humanistic Buddhism through his one-stroke calligraphy. And you will discover what's so good about his calligraphy is that they're simple, they're straightforward, they're understandable. 
and I usually cap this expression as that his one stroke calligraphy is something that is 听得懂, 记得住, 做得到. In other words, whoever comes across his writing, immediately you understand what he wants to say. And it's effortless for you to remember what he wants to tell you. And ultimately, it's never difficult to actually put such understanding into action. And so in the simple words of Ren Jian Fo Jiao, you know his lifetime dedication. And then in the fine four characters of Yong Ning Zheng Hao, you are once again reminded of his ultimate goal of building a humanistic pure land on earth with your presence. He says, I'm not going to be there alone. Right? He findeth not who seeks his own. A soul is lost that's saved alone. The Bodhisattva spirit of humanistic Buddhism is clearly displayed in these four characters. Yong Ning Hao. It's so good to have you. Having you in my life makes everything better, even the suffering I'm going through. And all of this comes down to his very Lingji root, which is Chan. Simplicity, purity, and straightforwardness. I'm going to use a few more examples of Venerable Master Xing Yun's Chan moments that I have witnessed in the days that I followed him around the world as his interpreter. You know that Venerable Master Xing Yun is widely acclaimed and is a well-known Buddhist master who has changed the lives of many people. So naturally, wherever he goes, he would always be swamped with a group of fans who would either break into tears out of excitement or lose the ability to contain themselves in the presence of his compassionate and witty heart. So there came a day when Venerable Master Xing Yun was overseas, and then a group of ladies saw him. Out of sheer excitement, they swamped him. So out of sheer excitement and the lost ability to contain themselves in the presence of Venerable Master Xing Yun, one of the very elegantly dressed lady fell flat on her face, just right in front of the Venerable Master. You would imagine how embarrassing that would be. And this moment of awkwardness was imme immediately resolved by Venerable Master, who placidly and nonchalantly turns around to the lady and says, Ibai. A Venerable next to Venerable Master immediately turned to the lady and said, Quick, say thank you to Venerable Master. So you would see the moments of awkwardness or so you will see a moment of awkwardness that would have turned out to be a lifetime's regret easily resolved by the two words uttered by Venerable Master in a very Chan way. And this is not the only moment. I remember in another year when we were in Singapore. After Venerable Master Xing Yun gave a public lecture to a crowd of more than 500, as he was about to leave the venue, there came this very angry man who squeezed through the crowd and came up to Venerable Master with a fist in his face and just shouted at Venerable Master, Don't you have anything to say to me? Out of utter shock, we didn't know what to do. But immediately Venerable Master Xing Yun turned to the man and says, Be persistent! And then, all of a sudden, the man's anger just dissolved into a big smile. And he said, oh wow, this is wonderful, Master, you do know me. He joined his palm, turned around, and went away. And on our way home, we turned to the Master and asked, did you know this man? He said, of course no. He was a stranger. So how did you know what to say to him? Nonchalantly. Placidly, Venerable Master Xing Yun turned to us and said, Who in this world doesn't need to be persistent? So you will see an angry confrontation between two strangers was immediately transformed into a wonderful moment of heart-to-heart -heart connection. Only our Master can achieve this. Not only is he a master of friendship and camaraderie, you will see often in moments of unexpected disaster, it dissolves everybody's fear and turns it into joy. 
This was during the days when Venerable Master started to become confined to the wheelchair. So he has to be wheeled everywhere, even in moments when he receives guests. So that was a particular day after he met with a very renowned and well-known public figure. As he returned to Chuan Lo in Foguangshan HQ, a group of people tried to squeeze into the elevator with him. And wouldn't you just love the moments when certain people are just so unfortunately ignorant that they do not realize the elevator is full and they, they shouldn't try to squeeze in? And so one of them continued to squeeze in till the moment the elevator doors just shut right into her face. And out of surprise, everybody inside the elevator exclaimed, Ah, omitofo. And then... Only Venerable Master quietly turns to everybody and says, What's better than Omitofo right now is that finger of yours. What he meant was, if you just stretched your finger and pressed the open button, that would have helped the poor unfortunate monastic, rather than just saying Omitofo in her face that was already being crushed by the elevator door. We know that the Chan moments presented by Venerable Master can sometimes also be rather personal. So this happened right before I became renounced. You know, for a young Buddhist, the most exciting thing about becoming renounced is probably what Dharma name we will receive. And so too were the abbots and the monastics at Nantian Temple, who actively participated in suggesting Dharma names for me. And finally, they came up with the word Miao Ru. And as the Dharma name Miao Ru was presented to Venerable Master Xing Yun, picked up the pen, put a big cross over it, and wrote Guang instead. We were all very happy. But certainly the abbots wanted to know why. Venerable Master Xing Yun wrote Guang instead of Ru for me, so she asked the question. And then in response, Venerable Master Xing Yun said, They are all foreigners whose Chinese is terrible. Why would you give them a name with so many characters? Every time they write their name, they will be torture. So Guang, only five strokes, nice and perfect. But later on, Venerable Master Xing Yun turned to me and reminded me that the name Miao Guang is a very wonderful Dharma name for the word light penetrates the vertical spaces of time as well as the horizontal spaces of physical space. Meaning that from this moment on, Miao Guang will be together with the sages of the past and present and future. And always bear in mind the sentient hearts of the people around me. And later on, he also gave me the calligraphy, Miao Guang Zi Zai, to remind me of the ultimate meaning. But who is to know? He first came up with the word Guang out of consideration for me, a terrible second generation immigrant who never learned much Chinese. I certainly appreciate his kindness and his consideration. This is one of the most recent moments where we see once again Despite being confined to the wheelchair and having lost most of his sight and hearing, Venerable Master's heart was always one with all living beings. This was in August of 2020, when Professor Charles Gao and his crew from Commonwealth Publishing visited Venerable Master Xing Yun. They came with good news of his latest documentary, and so Venerable Master Xing Yun happily asked his attendant to wheel him to the entrance of Chuan Den Lao at Foguangshan headquarters so he could personally meet Professor Charles Gao at the entrance, which is what he always does for his guests. However, on that day, Professor Gao was so excited about the document that he wanted to present to the community at Foguangshan. His arrival at Chuan Den Lo was delayed by almost half an hour. And Venerable Master Xing Yun, who has been waiting for the professor at the gate for quite some time, was again wheeled into the back of the building so that he could receive some space and quiet. But in the process of doing so, Venerable Master Xing Yun wasn't very happy. 
It kept saying, Don't do this. If you take me away, then I will lose. But unfortunately, the attendants were worried that he may need to pay a visit to the bathroom. And so, out of no choice, they insisted that he was moved to the back. So immediately when he was pushed to the back, Professor Gao arrived at the gate. He wasn't able to meet him. This made Venerable Master even more angry. And so after their happy meeting, when he returned to his founder's quarters, he kept saying, I've lost, I've lost. And Venerable Miao Guang, his secretary, and one who has served as his eye and ear, understood exactly what Venerable Master Xing Yun meant, that his hospitality was simply taken away by his moment of handicapped inconveniences. She too, out of her Chan moments and opportune moments, turned to Venerable Master Xing Yun and said, No, Venerable Master, you didn't lose. You waited for him, he also waited for you. So it's pretty much a tie. Having witnessed that moment, I was quite touched by the disciple's kind consideration for her master's eagerness to be the best host for his best guest, despite his inconveniences. So we would say it's a wonderful heritage of the Chan moments. To conclude, what are Venerable Master Xing Yun's Chan moments? Would you say that he has deviated from the scriptural doctrines? Would you say that he has forgotten the profound philosophical unfoldings of the profound teachings? We would say no. Instead, he is one who has perfectly internalized the Buddha's teachings of non-duality as well as compassion, displayed through the words of Pranya Wisdom. So whatever he does, it doesn't have to be complicated. He summarizes the greatest Chan moments into two words, Xing Fo. If you want to be at one with the Buddha, simply do what the Buddha did. And that is enough. This should conclude today's session on Chan Talk, Talk Chan. I hope that through a brief historical introduction of the origins of the word Gong An, to the basic methodology to how we can analyze and unfold a Chan Gong An. And finally, arriving at how Venerable Master Xing Yun internalizes understanding and practice in the simplest of words and actions, we too can find our own opportune moments or Chan Ji to share our attainments of the Buddha's Dharma and Pranya wisdom with anyone who crosses paths with us. Although there is a whole corpus of the Chan stories that we can read, but nevertheless, remember the most important thing about a Chan practitioner, especially for us, the descendants or the heirs of the Lingji lineage, is to never be away from our Buddha mind. To be at one with the Buddha mind is to be at one with all living beings. And when we are at one with all living beings, anything that we say or do will never fail to serve the purpose of liberating both self and others. So thank you very much for listening. Last but not least, stay awake. <laughs>